say amen. We are uh, gospel people uh, by God's grace, by God's power, by God's authority, by God's calling, called to preach, called to share, called to give the gospel out. Uh, different ways of talking about the gospel, different ways of explaining the gospel. Today we're going to be talking about uh, sharing the gospel. How do we go about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ? What is the gospel of Jesus Christ? Let's, uh, let's get into it. There's all different ways, opportunities uh, to express it, but what are the main components? What are the main elements of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Uh, there was a group of pastors that took advantage of a beautiful day. They went out in the golf course, and they got a caddy, and they had a great time, but man, there was a lot of terrible golf. A lot of horrible shots, a lot of horrible golfing. So the caddy says, uh, what do you guys you know, do for a living? I, I, I'm guessing that maybe you're ministers, maybe you're pastors. And they, they said, yeah, how'd you know? Easy. It's the worst golf I've ever seen and the cleanest language I've ever heard. <laughs> right? So they had their own opportunity therein to witness, to share why they were who they were. The gospel spreads through behaviors, through our lives, through our words. Uh, last week we began the kind of a review of the first part of Acts. We're, uh, in the coming weeks, we're going to be in the middle portion of the, of the book of Acts. The middle portion of the book of Acts, chapters 8 through 20. But I wanted, before we got there, to kind of review, kind of hit some of the high points in the first part of the book of Acts. Last week, uh, if you're here, we really talked about our mission as Christians. Mission as a church, our task as a church. We have a mission to share a message. A mission to share the message of Jesus Christ. He's called us to be witnesses. We're called to bear witness. Okay, great. So every time you come to church, Pastor John says, share the gospel, share the gospel. Be a witness, be an ambassador. And maybe you're thinking like, okay, great. Tell me what that is. What does that mean? What, what, is it, what does it mean to, to share the gospel? What, what's the message? Well, let, let's talk about the message today. Let's talk about the message. And, and what, what are the components? I mean, if somebody asks you, what, it, what, what is the gospel? How do I get saved? Would you know what to share with them? Well, let, let's talk about it today. Now, uh, let's, let's be realistic, however. Uh, we, if you look through the Bible, you're not going to find a precise script. Right? We all want that. If you look through the Bible, we want that chapter that says, here's exactly what you say in every situation. We'd like to have that, wouldn't we? Like, uh, tell me how to be saved, blah, 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 blah. Uh, you memorize it. We want that script. We want that memorized kind of outline, and, 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 and you're not going to find it. And why, why is that? It's because God gave us the gospel for all people at all times and all places, and people are at all different stages, people are at all different levels of belief and understanding. I mean, you go through all the people groups of the world and all the different heritages and all the different uh, backgrounds and worldviews and understandings. Uh, every gospel conversation is going to be unique. You can't pigeonhole it. You can't say, this is exactly what it's like every time. But there are principles. There are the truths that we want to communicate that are universal. But you're not going to find that perfect script that you get to memorize and, and just spurt out there. Every person's unique and every gospel encounter is unique. Every relationship that we have with people is unique. And uh, let this, uh, but there's encouragement here, right? There, some, of the, some of the encouragement we have is evangelical. Some of the encouragement we have is gospel-bearing people, gospel-bearing witnesses, right? Uh, last week we said that God sends the apostles, but He also sends us. But, but the encouragement there, God sent His Spirit, to the apostles, into their life for empowerment. God has sent the Spirit into your life, O believer. You have the living God in your life. You have the counselor, the guide, the teacher that will help you share the gospel. Know, know also that every time that you try to share, God has gone before you. The Holy Spirit convicts of sin. The Holy Spirit convicts the people of, the, of their need of God. You never go alone, in other words. It's not just you and your intellect and your power of, of speech. God cares about these people and loves these people more than you ever will. And so have confidence in that. And also know that God's word never comes back void. When you share God's truth with people, when you share God's 
heart with people, his teaching with people, his living word, it never comes back void. It's going to have an impact. It's going to have a power. It's going to have a, a, a change. It's going to bring fruit, in other words. Uh, you know, uh, the other thing I'd like to say before we talk about some of this stuff is, is really, uh, you don't have to be this super Christian. You don't have to be this higher level disciple or something to share the gospel. No, really what it's about is, um, in, in life, is uh, you and I just following Jesus. You and I walking with Jesus. You and I loving Jesus and, and just being authentic people, living that embodied life uh, of a, as a Christian, letting, letting God work through us and the fruit come from us. It, uh, we are witnessing, we are sharing gospel just by following and obeying Jesus and walking in his steps, right? And the other part of that is if we love people, if we care for people, some of this stuff is going to be so natural. Like we see their need, we see their brokenness, we see their hopelessness, we see their lostness, and, and if we love them, and we've known the love of Christ, we've known the power of Christ in our life, it's going to be something that just flows. It's not this script, that this, this chemical formula that you have to come up with and do, 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 you know, this kind of thing. It's like you're going to love people with the words that they need to hear. So don't, don't stress about it. Don't, don't worry about it. Don't feel that you're, you're always doing it wrong. No, God is in the midst. He's going to work through you in that situation where you're loving people and bringing the message of Jesus Christ to them. But what is it? How do we talk about it? What are the key components? Uh, let's go to Acts chapter 2. The book of Acts chapter 2. And we're going to pick up, pick up where we left off last week. Acts chapter 2, verse 14, please. <clears throat> Last week, just to set the table, remember what happened? Just as Jesus said, just as Jesus promised, the Holy Spirit came down at Pentecost. Uh, Jesus rose from the dead, right? After he died, he rose from the dead. For 40 days, he stayed with his, his, the, his, the apostles. He appeared to them. He taught them. He taught about the kingdom of God. He taught about wait for the Holy Spirit. He ascended into heaven after 40 days, right? And then there was 10 days of waiting and praying and seeking, seeking God. And on Pentecost, the 50th day, the Spirit fell. The Spirit came down, and they were filled with the Spirit, and, and they started to prophesy. They started to preach. They started to proclaim God's Word in, in Jerusalem there. But people said, ah, oh, they're a bunch of drunks. The, the, an excuse. Because God enabled them to speak in languages they never had learned to preach, to proclaim, to teach people about Jesus. It's a great miracle, in other words, but that's where we pick up. In verse 13, it says, uh, they're filled with new wine. They're, 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 they're drunk. So verse 14, but Peter, okay, he takes this opportunity. Something's happened. Part of our evangelism, part of our, our witness, part of our, sh our, our sharing and our, 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 our bringing Jesus to people is taking advantage of opportunities. God made a great opportunity in Jerusalem that day. So Peter stood up. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. These people aren't drunk, as you suppose. It's only the third hour of the day or, or nine o'clock in the morning. It's not happening. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. Notice what he's saying. This is that, what you've experienced now with, with the people proclaiming the mighty works of God in your language, this is that. Let me tell you, the prophecy of Joel came true in your midst today. And, in the, this, and this is the prophecy of Joel. In the last days, it shall be, God declares, that I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men well, dream dreams. So what's, what's going on here is, is, is Peter's saying, guess what? We're in the last days now. We're at the end of time in, in Jewish uh, eschatology, end times visions, end times teaching. When the Holy Spirit came, it was a signal of a new age, a new era, the, this, this era and then the age to come. Now they're in the age to come. We've been in the last days since Jesus Christ first came. And he says to these, he says to them, man, when Joel says, when, when, when the Spirit comes, 
All kinds of people are going to prophesy. Now, prophecy, not big P prophecy like Scripture, but small P prophecy. Revelations that God gives to people, and they speak in their own words about God. And so it's happening, uh, Peter's saying. There's this prophecy, this preaching, this teaching is happening from all kinds of people. Even on verse 18, even on male servants and female servants, in those days I'll pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. What, what a great image of pouring out the Spirit. It, it's meant to be like a rain cloud, like a, a thunderstorm with a vast amount of water coming out. The Spirit's been poured out on flesh, poured out on, on, on Jerusalem that day, and, and it hasn't stopped. It, whenever someone comes to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes. A, a deluge, a drenching, a baptism. It's a beautiful and wonderful and mighty and, and, and Peter's saying, this is that that you're experiencing. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth below, uh, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. So the last days, the end of the last days, a day is coming where there's going to be cosmological signs and wonders and, and we, we can't even hardly imagine what it's going to be like when Jesus Christ comes back. But he's predicting it. It started, in other words. Joel, Joel predicted, and Peter's saying it started. It's happening. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What, what an encouragement. Everybody who puts their faith in Jesus Christ will be saved. Everyone who calls, who puts their faith in God, who trusts in God for salvation, will be saved. Wow. What, what, a, what an incredible thing. So the Lord there, in originally in, in Joel... The Lord Yahweh, and now Peter's switching that to saying, hey, Yahweh is Jesus. Uh, he doesn't articulate a, a, a doctrine of Trinity here, but he's certainly moving in that direction. Uh, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And guess what he's going to talk about now? He's going to talk about Jesus. He's going to talk about uh, who Jesus is and what he did and what, what he accomplished. Uh, when we start sharing the gospel, what, what, it's, not, it's not this rocket science thing. It's not this huge, incredible, difficult task that only the professionals can do. Absolutely not. Throughout the world, for 2,000 years now, most gospel sharing has been done by lay people. In other words, non-pastor, non-minister types, non-priestly types. It's spread most effectively, effectively through people who aren't in pulpits, who aren't on a stage. It's people sharing life, sharing one another how they found Jesus, and, and how Jesus saves. It's, it's, what a calling, what, what a mission we have, that we're all witnesses. And I tell you what, even though there's been times in, in history when there's been preachers like Billy Graham who stand up and show the gospel and, and thousands come, the majority of people throughout church history, I would tell you, come through you sharing, people, you sharing with, com with your people, with your friends, with your peers, it's how it's happened for 2,000 years because the Spirit makes it possible. God moves through His people who love Him and want to honor Him and glorify Him, and they witness, and, and, and it happens. So here's Peter. He takes advantage of this opportunity, and it's, it's an incredible thing. He says, this is that. It was, the prophet Joel spoke about this, and it's happening. But then he goes deeper. He takes advantage of the opportunity of, of what this, this event that happened in Jerusalem he says, now let me tell you how, what it means in regards to Jesus. So, so he, he moves to this, this thing where he's talking. He takes advantage of an opportunity, and now let me talk about Jesus. Somehow, some way, when we start our gospel sharing, the gospel message, we're always talking about God. We're always talking about Jesus. We're bringing Jesus into focus. We're bringing Jesus into their, their, their sight. We bring forth God. We bring forth Jesus in our gospel sharing. So look at verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. And it was mostly men that came to, to the feasts, the festivals. They were required to come to the Jewish festivals. So he's not being sexist here. He's not being, you know, it's just mostly men in the crowd. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourself know. And let me, just, let me just hit these verses as they come, because there's just so much here. Uh, he's saying, you know Jesus of Nazareth. He was in your midst, wasn't he? And didn't God attest to his claims 
by doing miracles through him, by mighty works and signs. In other words, Peter's saying, uh, God, when Jesus Christ came up in his, his public ministry and he started doing things in your midst, uh, Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. Jesus claimed to be the Son of Man. In other words, Jesus claimed to be the Messiah. And God validated those claims by working through him miracles. Right? So you go through the Gospels and you, and you see again and again, preaching coming forth from, from Jesus validated by miracles and signs and wonders. So he says, hey, I'm talking about Jesus now. This is who he is, what he, what he did. But verse 23, this Jesus <clears throat> delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified, you killed him by the hands of lawless men. <laughs> uh, it, it's a moment where, uh, where people might be saying, okay. <clears throat> it's a moment where people might be saying, okay, uh, Jesus is the Messiah, you're claiming, Peter. How come he died? How, how, how could a Messiah die? You know, these, are, these are, are faithful, devout Jews, and if he's God's anointed, if he's God's Messiah, the Christ, how could he possibly die? And Peter says, this Messiah, he was killed by lawless men. You crucified him. You're guilty. You sinned against God by, by putting his Messiah to the Romans, by turning over his, God's Messiah to the Romans. But know, know this, it happened by God's definite plan. This wasn't an accident. This wasn't like God saying, oh, I hope this doesn't happen. This is sovereign God doing what God planned to do from eternity past. Jesus reigns. He's, he's the king. He's the eternal one. Right? This didn't come about by accident or chance or a contingency of history. God did this. Know it. And, and, and Peter really starts here, part of the gospel presentation is really bringing forth our problem with God or our, our issue with God, our separation from God. We've sinned against God. We've uh, wrecked our relationship with God. The, the old gospel presentation, the four spiritual, God, four spiritual laws. God loves you and has got a great plan for your life, but humanity is tinged with sin and, and we've, we've separated ourselves removed ourselves from experiencing God's plan. Peter starts down that road. God is, is almighty. God's all-powerful. Man, he's done miracles through Jesus. Jesus came from heaven. But you've blown it. You've separated yourself from God. You sinned against him. You killed the Messiah. Right? And, and so he's starting this process of you talk about God, Somehow you bring the, the, God is powerful, God's almighty, He's, we're answering to Him, we're, we're, we're subject to Him, but we've sinned against Him. We've destroyed our relationship, we've destroyed our future, we've destroyed the hope that we had in God by our evil actions and our wicked ways. So he's starting that process in, in his own particular way. Again, again, if you're looking for a formula to share the gospel... In the book of Acts, the Gospels, the Epistles, we have all these different examples of sharing the Gospel, but there's not one magic formula. <laughs> They're all different. So we see Peter's way of going about it. He starts with who Jesus is and God's wonder in his life, and then he moves on and says, this Jesus, yeah, he died, but God planned it. And the question is, why did he plan it? Why did he go about it? What Peter doesn't share in this, this gospel presentation is the matter of atonement. He doesn't share the reason why Jesus died, right? But in other gospel presentations, he doesn't have to with these people, and, and, and hold on a minute to that. So verse 24, but, as it were, yeah, God, you, you killed him, uh, God planned it, somehow the, your, 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 your will and God's sovereignty can't come together in a, in a unique way. It happened. But, verse 24, God raised him up, loosening the pangs of death. What, what, what a fascinating metaphor that is. Like birth pangs. Like, you know, uh, I, those things that women say are so hard. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Isn't that applied to death? 
Like, it's like a mixed metaphor of, he's talking about, like, death is holding on to Jesus. Death is pregnant with Jesus, and, and death's trying to keep the pregnancy from, the, the birth from coming. But it couldn't hold Jesus back. Death couldn't keep Jesus from coming back alive. Right? God's power, God's authority called him forth from the grave. And it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating, you know, what was Peter thinking there when he brought that up? But because it was not possible for him to be held by death. And then, then, he, then he, so he's talking about the resurrection, right? He died according to God's set purpose, God's, God's predestined plan. God's will was done, but it wasn't just that he died. And, and, and again, the, the, the behind the scenes, what we often want to talk about is, why did Jesus die? Peter doesn't go into it, but we want to talk about the atonement. Jesus died as a substitute in our place. He paid our debt. He, he took our sins. He he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquity, right? The celebration of the Lord's Supper is remembering that He died for us. He broke His body for us. He poured out His blood for us to save us. What, what, what a great thing that Jesus did for us. Taking the wrath of God so we wouldn't have to, covering our sins so we wouldn't have to pay for it. He saved us when we trusted in Him, when we put our faith in Him. So that, 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 that's, that's part of the gospel, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but... Uh, so, so it's not possible for death to hold on to Jesus. He, he came, he lived a life that God wanted him to live. He died according to the scriptures. And he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, just as what God planned. And so then, then, then Peter, he, speaking to his crowd, every gospel presentation is unique. So he's speaking to devout Jews, and so he quotes from the Old Testament, something that they would understand. It kind of goes over our head. It's like, I don't know why Peter brought that up, but he's speaking to a certain people. When we share the gospel, we're speaking to a person. We're speaking to a certain people. So we, 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 we tailor our, our message for them and their questions and their needs and their, 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 their hardships and their difficulties. But listen to what Peter says to these devout Jews. For David says concerning him, okay, so he's, you know, the, 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 the champion or the, the hero of the Jewish faith, David. David says about him, about Jesus, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life You'll make me full of gladness with your presence. So you read that, that uh, psalm in the Old Testament, you, you think it's talking about David, but Peter, under the inspiration of the Spirit, says Peter's, David's talking about Jesus. So he's, he's saying there's a prophecy about Jesus being raised. God planned it. So again, he's, he's building his case for who Jesus is and why they need to believe in him. 29. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath that, to him that he would set one of his descendants on the throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. That he was not abandoned to Hades, uh, the grave. He wasn't left in the grave, uh, separated from God forever. Nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus being raised up, and of that we are witnesses. And so, so he's, he's t telling these people, hey, the, the Old Testament, your scriptures, they preach Jesus, and we saw it happen. We saw him come alive. We're witnesses. Right? We're, we're testifying. We're, we're telling you what we've seen and experienced and, and what we know. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out that which you yourselves are seeing and hearing. So now he's moved on to the ascension. Now he's moved on to the exaltation of Jesus to the right hand of God. He, he's, he's, wow, what, he's talking about a whole scope of Jesus. He is the King of kings and he's the Lord of lords. We're just waiting for him to come back. Uh, but but he, he, he brings it full circle. Uh, what, when, they, when they came forward and, and they, they heard all the... Galileans uh, proclaiming and prophesying, preaching in their own languages. What's going on here? Peter's saying, Peter saying, remember Joel's prophecy, this is that? Well, what happened was Jesus was raised up by the Father. 
He was taken to the throne. He was given all authority and power. And now Jesus has sent the Spirit. He's poured out the Spirit. This is what you're experiencing. It, it's, it's, it's quite the testimony about Jesus, about Jesus' authority, about Jesus' place in the world, His place over us as the Lord Almighty, His power over what happens in the world, His sovereign plan being implemented and executed by Jesus. Verse 34, again, he said He's trying to build a case He's trying to build a case for who Jesus is and why they should trust in Him. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says. So David again, you, you guys, the, the hero of the Jewish, Jewish faith, the hero of the Jewish religion of, of Judaism in the day. David says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So uh, David predicted that uh, in Psalm 110, that uh, Jesus would be exalted, and it happened. Therefore, verse 36, he comes to a crescendo here. He comes to, wow, listen to me. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Uh, wow, we, we, so he, he's, he's making his point again. Uh, did I tell you earlier that you killed him? Did, did I tell you earlier that you have a problem? Did I, did I tell you earlier that, that you have a serious problem with the living God? You crucified His Messiah. You're responsible. Dead men walking. In other words, he, he, He's brought the execution of judgment upon them. Uh, if you killed God's Messiah, you're condemned. You have no hope. You are outside of the kingdom forever. There's no way that God's going to raise you from the dead when Jesus Christ comes back, the Lord. You're hopeless, in other words, because God the Father has declared him. He, he already was, but in time, in history, through the execution of the resurrection, God has made him Lord and Christ. And in the context, you know, the word there behind the scenes is repeated several times. It's talking about the Father and it's talking about Jesus. He's God and He's the Messiah. In other words, He's the ruler that you've been waiting for. He's the King that you've been hoping for. He's the Almighty who's going to reign over a kingdom that is to come. And so in, in, our, in our gospel presentations, you know, we, if we're going to kind of pull out the, the behind-the-scenes principles or the, the... We just start talking about God in some fashion. Witnessing. How, how do you go about it? Well, you look for opportunities. You look for opportunities. Uh, people are curious about God. They're, they're curious about uh, this world and if there's spirituality behind the, the historical happenings, the way that things are going in life. Did God do that? Is God involved in that? We look for opportunities just to talk about God. To raise the issue of God and of Jesus. Hey, I see you got a bumper that sticker there that says such and such. I see you got that wall hanging in your house. I, I heard you take uh, Jesus' name in vain. Are, are you a believer? Are, are you someone who believes in God or not? And, and it's, it's a way of moving forward. You just find a way of talking about God. You know, sharing the gospel, being, bearing witness. And somehow we're, we're, so, we're so invested in God and we love Jesus so much. How can we not talk about God? You know, if he's, our, if he's our, our pearl of great price, as it were, if he's our, our, our riches, if he's the thing, our treasure in heaven, won't, won't that be on, on the tip of our, our tongue, so to speak? We, we want to talk about God. But then uh, we move into some, somehow, some way, we move into a conversation about how, how is your relationship with God? Do you know where you stand with God? Um, are you living under God's rule? Are, are, you, are you somehow connected with God? Let's talk about it. He's done that here. In other words, uh, Peter's raised a problem. God is, <laughs> and you sinned against Him. Right? We raise an issue about God, and then, then we talk about our problem with God. You know, we boy, I don't know about you, but I, I, I'm broken, and I, I've made so many mistakes, and and uh, you find your own way of, of opening the door. 
Maybe someone that you're working with you're, or a family member, just, uh, man, I, I'm so sorry. I keep, I keep screwing up. I keep doing bad things, and I seem powerless to, to stop. And th that's your open door. It's an opportunity. Well, let me tell you about humanity, and, and that this is where God's Word comes in, right? Uh, whenever I get the opportunity to share the gospel, I'm always taking them to the Scripture. Something about God and something about how we've fallen short of the glory of God that we're all sinful and we, we all are, are, are dealing with our own sinful ways and our own sinful nature. Talk about God and then you bring up the problem that we have in our relationship with God. Our sin has separated us from God, removed us from God's plan, and not, not His plan necessarily, but our, our experience of His good plan. He's removed us, right? And, and so Peter says here, man, you, you, you've killed the Lord, the Christ, and how do you think that, that the people are processing that? This is where the Holy Spirit takes over, right? If, if we've shared as Peter shares, if we've shared about our problem with God and the sin that we have, the brokenness we have, this is where the conviction of the Spirit, God's at work in these people's lives. Look what happens next. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, uh, Jewish brothers, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. With many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourself from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. How did that come about? Uh, Peter talked about God, about Jesus. He, he talked about their need for, for, for salvation, their, their problem. <laughs> you you get, and, and by God's grace, uh, there was a conviction among the people. They recognized their need. They recognized their sinfulness. They recognized their brokenness. There's this desperate question once they realize that they face the judgment of God. There's this desperate understanding of what should we do? Uh, what, what can we do? We're hopeless. The we, we, we have no hope. How, how can we overcome this, this, this judgment that's going to come upon us, this condemnation? What should we do, brothers? Do you know? Do you know? Tell us. Tell us how we can be saved. Uh, if, we've, if we've brought the character of God before people and the reality of God before people and that they answer to God and that they are sinners before God, that they are guilty before God, somehow in our individual conversations with people, our unique gospel talk with them, that we love them and we love God and we've, we've shared with them and the Spirit's led us to share certain scriptures and share truths, at some point, they're going to recognize their need. If they're ready to hear the way of salvation, they're going to, they're going to be piqued, they're going to be prompted, they're going to be cut to the heart. And they're going to want to know how they can be right with God, how they can be forgiven of their sins, how they can have life. And so Peter tells him the solution. Talk about God, talk about the problem, then you talk about the solution. Then you call them to respond. It, you know, and it doesn't have to be in that order. Every conversation is unique. Don't think, again, we're, we don't have a script to follow. We, we just have these truths. Talk about God, bring God into the conversation. Bring somehow, maybe it's a course of years, maybe it's a course of five minutes, you talk about their problem. And then you talk about the solution that God has provided. Not how they can save themselves, but how God has provided a means for them to be saved. So again, we get to talk about Jesus. And then call them to faith. Call them to respond. Call them to believe. So in verse 37, you know, they're, they're like, hey... <laughs> Uh, help us out here, they're convicted of sin, they're convicted of their, their journey to death, they're convicted that they will not see heaven, they're convict, convicted that they are headed to hell. So verse 38, Peter says to them, repent 
and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Uh, there, there's, some, there's always, uh, in, in conversations, why should I repent? Why should I believe in Jesus? Well, Peter tells him here, for forgiveness of sins. <laughs> your problem is that you have sinned against God. Let me tell you the solution, that you can be forgiven. And the promise of a Holy Spirit coming, what you've seen happen to the Galileans, these Jewish brothers who are following Jesus, the Spirit came on them. And if you do what I say, if you repent and believe and be baptized, then it'll happen to you as well. The Spirit will come. In other words, when the Holy Spirit comes, it means new life has come. It's, it's like a, a summary statement. And, and uh, in Acts, Luke is, is famous for all his, uh, his little shortcuts and all his ways of talking about uh, salvation and repentance. And, and, uh, and so he, he narrows it down to a very specific thing. He says to them, repent. What is repentance? You've heard preachers like me speak about this a lot. And sometimes it's been like, repent! Right? My, my kids would often give me a hard time growing up about sometimes when I'd start, repent! <laughs> Turn! And, and what does it mean? It's agreeing with God that I screwed up. It's agreeing with God that I've gone down the wrong track. It's agreeing with God that I have not walked in obedience to God or obeyed God. It's this, it starts in the intellect. It's this, this decision of the will that I've gone that way. I've lived that life. I've rejected Jesus in a turn. I'm now going to accept Jesus. I'm, not gonna, I'm now going to follow Jesus. I'm, not, I'm now going to walk with Jesus. Right? It, it's this, it starts in the intellect, but it plays out in life over time. A true turning to Jesus is not just an emotionalism. It's not just a sorrow for sin. It's this turn to Jesus in now, but through life. It's this, uh, now I'm walking with the Lord kind of a thing. He calls them to repent, to turn. Uh, and then he says something really interesting. Repent to be baptized. Is he saying to be, to be saved, I need to be baptized? Absolutely not. Uh, throughout all the, all the book of Acts, you're going to see many gospel presentations, and many of them don't include baptism. Through the epistles, the Apostle Paul and, and Peter himself and other places, he doesn't call for baptism for salvation. Baptism was a very important, it, it, it's contextual. The baptism for the Jewish people was, a sign, was given to the Gentiles who converted to Judaism. It was an outward sign of surrender. It was an outward sign of submission. In other words, baptism is an outward sign that shows faith. An outward act that shows what's happened on the inside. An outward, an outward act of submission that shows belief and trust in God. In other words, it's a summary of kind of the, the what, what do you do when you convert? It's a, it, you, you believe, you repent, you turn, and you believe. It's like this, this two-step two thing. You, here's my sin. You turn from that, you turn to Jesus, you believe in Jesus, okay? And then public, a public profession of my faith is baptism, where I show my belief and I, and I kind of prove it to others because I'm willing to be baptized. But a, a good way to say it is it, to, when we call people to respond to say, you need to repent and you need to believe in Jesus. You repent and trust in Jesus for what he's done for you on the basis of what he's done for you, his person, his work, trust in him. So, so again, uh, we, we, we somehow in our relationships with lost people, in our home, at school, in our businesses, somehow we're looking for opportunities to talk about God, and who he is, how great he is, how wonderful he is, talk about Jesus. And then we look for opportunities to talk about who we are as people, Man, our sinful nature, the flesh, man, I'm, the brokenness that we have. But you realize we're sinners. You realize that we're, we're you look for opportunities to talk about we've separated from God. Man, that act I did, it, it's heinous in God's sight. But, and so we're working towards bringing them to a conclusion, a theological conclusion, but a, a conclusion of the heart. That I, I've sinned against God and I have no hope for judgment is mine. I've earned the wrath of God. In, in our culture, that's hard because God is, is described in certain ways. 
and he, he loves everybody, you know, just kind of a grandpa that just pats everybody on the head, and there's no judgment in our, in our secular idea of God uh, in, this, in this culture. So we have to battle against that and bring forth the word of God. We bring forth a problem. You know, the wages of sin is death. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We bring forth these scriptures, and then hopefully over time, they, they come back and, and we're able to uh, say to them how uh, the, the problem is solved, right? They're, they're cut to the heart. Hopefully there's repentance and, or hopefully there's, there's this brokenness in them and they ask us how. And, and sometimes it's, a, it's a, you know, these four parts of the gospel, it's, it's a 10-minute conversation, but oftentimes it might take months or even years for these people that we're praying for and loving and serving, right? But at po- some point we get to the solution your solution to your sin problem, your solution to your separation from God problem, your solution to your going to hell problem is Jesus Christ. He died for your sins. He died to rescue you. He came from heaven to earth to bring you to God, to reconcile you to the Father, to make a way. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Trust in Him. So the problem solution. And then, then Peter tells him what to do, right? We tell him the solution, but then we make an invitation. At some point, we call them to believe. We call them to trust. We call them to put all their weight on Jesus, all their life on Jesus, to surrender to Jesus completely and totally. Uh, uh, Peter brings that out here when, when he says, um, The promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. With many other words, he bore witness, continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourself. From this crooked generation, save yourself, make the decision, cross the line, live by faith, believe in Jesus today for salvation. And, and, and they did. What a great moment where the Spirit of God worked among these people and 3,000 were saved, about 3,000. They, they, you know, imprecise counting. Who's, who's got the clicker in the crowd, right? Who knows exactly? Guesstimate, a sanctified estimate going on there. But it happened, and what a beautiful thing, what a beautiful moment, what a beautiful season. Brothers and sisters, uh, again, maybe, maybe sometimes you sit in church, churches like this, and preachers have said, share the gospel, and you've always felt so inadequate, and you've always felt like, I don't have it all together, I don't know enough. Yes, you do. You got the Word of God, right? And, and, and you know that God's going to be with you. You've been given the Holy Spirit. And you know that God's going before you to the people that are lost in your workplace, the people that are lost in your school, the people that are lost in, in your home. God's working to convict them of sin, convict them of their need for salvation, right? And I tell you what, um, if, you're, if you're loving them, if you want to see them saved, the words are going to come. The truth's going to come. As you, as you just, you're looking for opportunities. You're praying for them. You're praying for opportunities. Right? But it takes this for, from our side of things. Let's turn the switch on. Let, let's, let's engage our, 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 our seeking to save the lost. You know, Jesus came to seek and save the lost. How, 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 how long has it been since you've gone on a search mode for lost people? How long have you, have you started thinking about people Bring them into the kingdom. Bring them under the reign of the king. Calling them to faith. Calling them to belief. Oftentimes, it doesn't happen because we're not looking for opportunities. I tell you what, if if you start praying for opportunities, you start looking for opportunities, God's going to bring them. And so as as we start living this life of reaching people for Jesus Christ and and, and bringing the gospel to them, uh, things are going to happen. God's going to be at work, right? So we just cultivate this relationship. We cultivate... You know, we're, we're embodying Jesus in our life. We're living the Christian life. We're, we're doing everything we can to obey Jesus, and people are watching us, and, and then we're planting seeds. We're, we're sharing about our faith. Hey, I went to church last week. I, in, one, in my private time, what would you do this weekend? Well, I, I went to church, or I, I, I read the Bible, and, and the, the planting the seeds that we're, we're a believing people, God's going to work in them, and sooner or later, questions are going to arise. Why didn't you cheat with us when we, when we ripped off the boss? Why didn't you go with us when we went out drinking and partying? And, and, and why didn't you do those things? And, and you have the opportunity when you're walking with Jesus and you're looking for opportunities to bring forth the gospel. 
I believe in God, right? And, but the problem is this. This, this life is going to happen. The solution is this. Won't you believe in Jesus? Talk about God. Talk about the problem. Talk about solution. Invitation. You can do that, brothers and sisters. It's happened for 2,000 years now. Through people, through people that have nowhere near your education, through all kinds of people in, in jungles, in mountaintops, in cities that have nowhere near your intellect, as it were, your, your, your understanding of, of life and history. God has worked through people. He's going to work through you too. He will work. Let's join him in this bearing witness to Jesus that we've been called to. Luke, would you please come? It's, it's a big deal. By God's grace, he's chosen us to be the bearers of the gospel. He sent us to be his witnesses. Let's obey. Let's go. Let's do this for God's glory, for his fame, for his honor, for his worship. Because what happened when these 3,000 confessed Christ? What happened when these 3,000 repented and believed and then got baptized? 3,000 worshipers were made. And through these people, God got the glory, and God got the fame, and it spread, and it spread, and it spread, even to us today. Let's keep it going. There's so many lost people in our valley, in our valley. so many people that are far from God. Who's going to bring the gospel to them? God has called us. We can do it. Let's go. Bring God into the picture. Share the problem. Share the solution. Invite for salvation. Jesus Christ is worthy of our witness. Lord God Almighty, thank you for saving us. Thank you for saving us by grace alone, faith alone in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that uh, you opened our eyes to our need for rescue. Uh, when we were hopeless, you, you, you came into our life and, and you, you, you made us yours. Lord, you, you gave us hope. Lord, when we were in bondage, you redeemed us. When we were far from God, you reconciled us. When, when, when we were lost, you saved us. When we were dead in our sins and transgressions, you gave us life. Lord, we worship you today. Lord, we pray that, uh, Lord God, there, there would be this, uh, this, 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 this church, the other churches of the valley, that, that we would be on mission, Lord. That we'd be on mission with the message of Jesus Christ. And we pray that thousands in our valley would come to worship you. That they'd turn to you and be saved. That they'd entrust themselves to you. Lord, as these 3,000 did at Pentecost, Lord, that they, they would repent of their sins. They believe in you and trust in you and be your people. Lord God, may that be the case. Lord God, but we, we worship you today. We thank you today. Uh, we, had no, we have no right to heaven. We have no right to eternity. But by your grace, you made a way. By your grace, you saved us when we didn't deserve us when we didn't deserve it. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for saving us, Lord. And may you be worshipped. Lord, send us out now. We uh, thank you for meeting with us. We, we thank you for being with us today and letting us exalt you and praise you and offer to you and pray to you and open your word. Now send us out, Lord, as your worshipers. And may we glorify you as, as we go in this, this week. God bless, you. God bless us, Lord. Pour out your spirit on us and be magnified. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.